Hello everyone and welcome. We're delighted you've been able to join us today for what I'm sure is going to be a most informative session. For those of you who attended Film Victoria's recent feature film development event held a couple of weeks ago, you may recall that I touched on some key challenges Australian filmmakers are currently facing. From knowing when your script is the best it can be, how to raise production finance, navigating the changing distribution landscape, or finding a reasonably sized audience who are proving increasingly discerning and elusive to warrant the expense and hazards of a theatrical release for your feature film. The Australian domestic marketplace is small and the cost of making a well-crafted film is not cheap. Audiences are spoilt for choice when it comes to selecting a film to watch on the big screen. Remembering they have between four to 500 new releases to choose from a year and on average, they maybe go four to eight times a year, if you're lucky. Sales agents and distributors around the world are also spoilt for choice, with some 4,000 films to select from. They're going to be quite picky when choosing the ones that are worthy of the time and energy to promote, place and sell these. Remembering most mid-sized sales agents will only take on maybe four to 10 films a year. In Australia, most distributors will select perhaps two or three Australian films to sit alongside their international projects. Sales agents and distributors are people, are business people, and they want to back films they think will help them stay in business. As filmmakers, it's important to understand that the landscape you face here in Australia is no different to that that is faced by independent filmmakers everywhere particularly for our English-speaking counterparts in the US and the UK, but also for your European counterparts who face the same challenges. US studio films are increasingly dominating box office takings, and whilst audiences for specialty or art house films are shrinking markedly. So what can you do to ensure your film will be able to cut through? What do you need to think about from the outset when you're contemplating what writing, producing, directing, or dare I even suggest investing in a feature film? How do you put together a project that also has a solid business proposition behind it that the marketplace will back, and one that they are convinced can be sold to an audience willing to pay $20 a ticket, whether they're gonna watch it online or perhaps download it for a lesser amount? All challenging and interesting questions with no necessarily straightforward or easy answers. This year, Film Victoria is focusing on the business of feature films as, as one of our themes. We hope to stimulate the conversation by providing a series of events such as this one we're having today. And to that end, we're delighted to have been able to lure Stacey Parks along this afternoon to share with you her perspective on film financing and the marketplace in an ever-changing and competitive landscape. Stacey is recognised as an expert in the business of independent film distribution. She has worked as a foreign sales agent before founding Film Specific, a website dedicated to educating filmmakers about independent film financing, distribution and marketing. Film, spe film Specific is recognised as one of the top 25 websites that filmmakers need to know about. Stacey's written a book, The Insider's Guide to Independent Film Distribution, which is also recognised as an essential handbook for independent filmmakers worldwide, seeking production and in distribution insight for their films. With a master's degree in international business, Stacey has lectured extensively on the subject of independent film distribution across the USA and Europe, including at AFM, the Cannes Film Festival and the British Film Institute. The great thing about Stacey is she travels to all the film markets on a regular basis, so she's loaded with intelligence. And most recently, she's been to Berlin, Sundance and AFM. We're very lucky to have Stacey here with us in Melbourne, and she's going to very generously share with you some practical tips of, of things that you may want to consider before you embark on financing your next feature film. Please join me in welcoming Stacey. You guys hear me okay? Yeah. So thank you for having me. Uh, thank you to Jenny for inviting me. Uh, it's been a while since I've been back uh, in Australia. I think it's been about four years. And um, so anyway, it's good to be back. And we have a lot to talk about in a short amount of time. So I want to focus in on, uh, like Jenny said, we're going to talk about the current marketplace, like 
I've just come from AFM, Sundance, EFM, so I want to share some of that intelligence with you guys. And I also want to leave some time at the end to answer some questions about your projects. Can we turn these lights down just a little bit, if that's OK, please? Um, thank you. That's better. Um, so I'm going to start us off today uh, with a little video. And I'm actually going to pepper this presentation with some video clips from a movie called Seduced and Abandoned. I don't know. Has anybody seen that in the room? couple people. So uh, really funny. You'll probably want to watch after you see a bunch of the clips I'm going to show today. It's uh, a documentary by James Toback and Alec Baldwin about a trip they did to the Cannes Film Festival a couple of years ago looking for money for a fictitious film they were putting together. And it just highlights a lot of the themes that I want to talk about today. And it's going to bring some levity to this discussion <laughs> that otherwise can get depressing at times. So. Um, I'm going to kick us off with the trailer to this film, so to sort of set the stage here. What are you doing in town? We're making a film. I get it. So if you're making a documentary about trying to get financing. That's right. Never enough money. We need between 15 and say 18 million dollars. 15 million dollars to about 10 million. Four or five million. Your name will be on the screen as the producer of my next film. You ready to put up 15 million? What? I have Alec for this next film. Alec Seriously? Alec? He's a TV actor. It's, it's a political romantic adventure. It's supposed to be comedy. And there will no, be no, 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 but I'm willing to give it a shot. We may have to adjust the concept of this movie a little bit. Great films with great directors, that's the pinnacle. When Scorsese called me and asked me, I can't tell you what it meant to me. I could probably get the backing now for a number of pictures, but it has to be their pictures. What do you have to do to get to be able to make the movies that you have in your heart? When I make a movie, all I think is What's the profit? I had finished two Godfather films, won a ton of Oscars, six of them, and I threw them out the window, and my mother went, so you shouldn't do that. Every film is like a master class. I always love movies. My mother wanted punishment, she'd take them away from me. Sometimes I put them down the front of my pants because I like the way they sound. <laughs> my whole art film is the most important. You have to fight very, very, very hard to do what you want, because it always comes down to the money. The movie business is the worst robber you've ever had. You are seduced and abandoned over and over and over again. I must tell you, I'm optimistic. So, really funny film. Uh, check that out <clears throat> when you get a chance. But like I said, it's about uh, so James Toback and Alec Baldwin go to Cannes to try to raise money for a fictitious film, and it's they go in saying we want to rate the budget is between 15 and 18 million, and all the meetings they take, whether it's with financiers, sales agents, um, distributors, tell them, okay, with the names you have, you're looking at four to five million, and they basically say it to Alec Baldwin's face. He says, I'm starring in the movie, and they say you're not worth that. So it's just really funny. I mean, who's had that experience before? Has anybody been to a film market where they've shopped their film and people are saying, it's not worth that. You have to make it for this. Anybody? OK, so you know, <laughs> you know what that feels like. And you know what's happening now in the marketplace, in, and they say it uh, in this film, is that over, particularly over the last five years, what's happened is, and the reason why you keep hearing everybody say you have to make your movies for less, it's actually because the acquisition prices have gotten so low. So you can't now go out, even the films that win Sundance, and I'm going to get into that today, and the biggest festivals aren't getting acquired for these big numbers anymore. So it's just forcing us to adapt to lower budgets altogether. Um, so Jenny told you a little bit about me, but I'll just, uh, for those of you who don't know, I actually started uh, in the business working for the William Morris Agency in packaging. So I used to work for Cassian Elwes. He's one of my original mentors in the business. I studied packaging and pre-sales with him. And then I was a sales agent for seven years. 
Um, and then I um, am now a producer, an executive producer on film. So I'm in the trenches with you guys. So I understand what it's like to have to cram as much value as possible into a low budget. Or if, you, if I want to make something that's a higher budget, scale it to places you never thought you had to in order to justify a $10 million budget these days. So a good place to start then is talking about reverse engineering your budget. And I'm just going to keep my notes here. I wrote out a bunch of notes because we don't have a ton of time to talk about all this stuff. I want to leave time for questions. So I just want to make sure I'm not um, forgetting anything. So there are so many international markets and opportunities to be a part of these days. And even as I, I work with a lot of clients, not only in the US, but in the UK and Australia, and the message that I give everybody is that you have to look beyond your borders to finance your film, to even cast your film sometime, to look for private investment. And even um, my students in the US, people are now doing searching for film finance outside of the US. They're going to the European markets and meeting with investors there. I have um, a German client who found an Australian investor, and we met with him at, at Berlin. So literally, the, the borders are, are opening a lot. And there's platforms. Has anybody heard of slated.com? So if you haven't, write that down, slated.com. It's a, it's a really interesting uh, platform. They used to, used to have to have an invite to join. Now it's open doors. But basically what it is is it's a marketplace for uh, features and docs and investors from all over the world. It's taking that concept of angel investing from the tech world and sort of matching it to the film world. And so that is one of the places where you can go you can create a profile for your film and start researching private equity investors, um, people from all over the world. And I always suggest looking for people who are investing in budgets similar to yours, genres similar to yours. And if you can't contact them through that site for whatever reason, cross-reference your research over on IMDb Pro. So hopefully everybody's familiar with IMDb Pro. You use that platform. Between Slated and IMDb Pro, those two platforms, you should be able to um, research investors. Uh, and we'll, we're going to get to that in a minute. I'll talk about business plans and all of that stuff further on. Um, but basically, when we're talking about reverse engineering your budget, I want you to approach your budget thinking, what is the end result you want? If you're trying to realize that if you're trying to make a film that is um, sort of, if you want to go international with it, okay, you want to do an international release, then right away that means that you are going to have to have international level talent probably. And well, if you're going to get international level talent, you probably are going to need some type of uh, theatrical level director. And now all of a sudden the budget is scaling up and up and up. And so as a newer producer, you want to think about if you want to go that route, realize the elements that you're going to have to have in place to justify a $10 million, $15 million budget these days. Otherwise, um, it's pretty much going to have to be $2 million and under. And uh, well, I have another slide. It's coming up in a minute called the $2 to $10 million, uh, $2 to $10 million dead zone. Has anybody heard of that? It either has to be really big or really small. So you're familiar with that. So the first thing I want to introduce you to is the concept of reverse engineering your budget for the marketplace. And so let's say you're even starting with a script and you're thinking, OK, I want this. I want to have this. I want to make it for $8 million or $10 million. Well, in order to do that, realize that you're going to have to attach those level of elements, OK? And if you're not, then you need to be making it for $2 million and under. And like I said, the reason is that because in the marketplace, acquisition prices have gotten so much lower that it's actually almost impossible to make $10 million back 
on a budget. So it has to be so out of this world with, with talent and theatrical level director in order to justify that. Um, so you're going to hear today in some of the case studies and stories that I share with you that um, about some of these acquisition prices, and I'll get to that later on in the uh, presentation. Now, the good news is that actually when it comes to distribution, those opportunities have gotten a lot more plentiful with a lot of the uh, VOD channels that are out there, um, not only here, but all over the world. In fact, a lot of the uh, consulting that I do in the US is for international filmmakers who want to tap into the VOD market in the US because it's, in the US, the, the DVD business has pretty much converted totally over to VOD. So all the, DV, the companies that used to be DVD distributors have pretty much um, abandoned retail DVD in favor of the VOD. So everything has gone digital, with some exceptions. There's a small retail uh, DVD distribution um, industry left, but it's very, very thin. So the good news is there's, if you go to Sundance, there's so many more distributors there now, and AFM and EFM. So the, the opportunities are plentiful. They're just not paying a lot of money. So if you want to be, uh, you know, I want you guys to approach making your movies from a fiscally responsible place to be able to think responsibly about, OK, how am I going to make this money back before you um, go into it. And I have this concept I call distribution in reverse. And that was actually one of the, uh, it was it's kind of the, the premise that my, that my book was built on. Um, and that was because basically for me as a sales agent, it was always so frustrating to work with filmmakers who would come to me with their film and we'd sign them on as clients. Um, but they had made their films for $1 million, $2 million, $3 million. But I knew in my heart I could only get maybe 50000 or 100000 or 200000 out of the marketplace. And after many years of being a sales agent, that's sort of what led me to write my book in the first place because it was like, if people would only just reverse engineer from the market, look at the opportunities that are available first and how much distributors are paying and then back into your budget from there. So the problem. I, I also, one of the most popular seminars I gave, and this was like about three years ago, it was called um, Why Big Budget Indies Won't Work. And um, it was based on an article I had read. Um, this was, I can't remember the name of it, but it was an animated film, and the producers decided to do it independently. Well, they spent $40 million, and they thought, oh no, we're gonna, we don't, you know, we're gonna do this totally independently. Um, obviously, animation is very expensive, so $40 million later, they had their movie. And they made zero. They literally got, it was executed okay. It definitely wasn't on the level of Pixar or anything like that, but they couldn't get distribution. So they were forced to um, come raise more money, uh, come up with P&A and put it in theaters, and they put it out in theaters, and they literally made like pennies. And there was an article, I believe it was in the Wall Street Journal about this. And it just, it, I, wrote a, I wrote a whole newsletter on it about why big budget indies don't work. And the premise is that, uh, you know, you can go out and spend all this money, but if you haven't, if you don't have distribution baked into your budget in the form of pre-sales, that's an awful lot of risk to take. <laughs> um, 40 million, but even, even five or 10 million in today's marketplaces. So that's the idea is that you want to have sussed out these opportunities first before you start the process. Um, <clears throat> now, also the other thing, my biggest issue with big budget indies is this. If you don't get into one of the major festivals, and by that I'm talking about Sundance, Cannes, Berlin, Toronto, or Venice. So there's about five. If you don't get into one of those, it's, you're dead in the water for any type of major acquisition price. And that is a heck of a lot of risk to take when you're making a film. So it's like playing the lottery. So I always say to people, they come to me and they say, I want to make my film for $2 million. Okay, that's fine. But realize that only 
the only way that you're going to get bought out for anything more than that would be if you got into one of these festivals. So that's one of the, the main problems I have with big budget indies is that you're really playing the lottery. Um, it's very, very difficult to pull that money out of the market otherwise. Does anyone have experience with that, um, sell, try, making a movie for a certain amount and then going to sell it and not making it back? Yes? <laughs> anyone brave enough to want to tell their story? Um, but we're going to be, I'll be doing questions later. I'd love to hear what some of your experience has been with that. But um, it's just, and it's just getting worse and worse. So at this Sundance, um, you know, some of the top prices paid were only two to three million dollars. So what about the films that were made for like five and seven? Well, depending on how the deal was, if those were, if that was just North America or just certain English speaking territories, granted, they may have you know, some unsold territories to go after. But the US and English speaking and North America are typically going to be your biggest acquisition prices anyway. So um, <clears throat> that's what's going on out there. Now, if we talk about AFM and EFM, so I consult with a lot of filmmakers prior to these film markets. And um, I had a client come to me just this last AFM, and she had made a film. She came to me with a completed film, um, and it had uh, no big names in it. In fact, she was the writer, director, and star. Okay, so um, and had very, very high hopes for this film. Now, I think she may have made. I think it was maybe five hundred thousand to a million. And she, you know, came to me with the completed film. I introduced her to some sales companies who took it to AFM, that sort of thing. Well, the film only ended up making um, maybe fifty thousand dollars in sales, and that's normal. I mean, this is what happens a lot of times, unless there are certain elements there to get it higher prices. Um, it was not a theatrical level cast. It wasn't even really a theatrical type of film. So this happens all the time at film markets where people go with $500,000 million films and literally they're only making $20,000 or $50,000. So that's a, it's a big difference. And that's why you know, we can do so much more if we start at the beginning with this process and try to reverse engineer the budget and reverse engineer the elements rather than just steamrolling the process and making the movie you want to make and then being disappointed later when you didn't realize that the numbers were so low. <clears throat> so let's talk about that two to ten million dollar dead zone. Has anybody heard of this? That it either has to be really big or really small? Yeah, so people are talking about that over here. Um, I've heard this probably since last can was the first time I heard it. In fact, they had an entire seminar series on it. Um, and it was basically called the two to $10 million dead zone. And then that got carried over to AFM and then to EFM. <laughs> and basically the idea is that is this. People who, what they did is they studied the market and the films that were being made for eight million, for example, were getting the same acquisition prices as films that were two million. And the reason is because within that zone, you're still dealing with um, a certain level actor and director, so it's not really a theatrical level film. Only when you go beyond this $10 million uh, threshold uh, can you access a theatrical level director, which then can attract theatrical level talent, which then means it's a theatrical film, can it command higher prices in the marketplace? So the idea is that either you're going to make it for over 10 million, or you might as well make it for two, because anything in the middle, you're just going to get paid the same price, so it's basically flushing money down the toilet. Now, that is just a general rule of thumb, obviously. I'm sure there's some exceptions. I'm sure maybe some of you guys have heard of exceptions to the rule. So, um, but this is just something in general I wanted you guys to, to keep in mind that, um, and uh, I have a video clip here I'll pull in a moment where they say it's either really big or, or it might as well be really small. Anyone have experience making like a, a a film in that range and falling into that zone yet? We have many, but 
Yeah. <laughs> okay. Any number of them in the Australian marketplace. So you've experienced that as well. Yeah. All right, let me, I'm going to pull up another uh, video clip. And I apologize for the audio on these uh, because I had to screen cast them from YouTube in order to make them work. And this is again seduced and abandoned. I do. He, he's really the Legendary pioneer. Uh, he's what did he pioneer? The, the, the process of foreign sales where you get a movie financed based on cast names with a projection For of what? pre-sale. That's right. Show them a business plan that'll work. And if I can project what my sales will be, then I can show them what I think the U.S. should be. And if I can project that they'll get their monies back in a profit, I can probably finance any picture that I want to. I, I, I just finished funding an $80 million picture with the Denzel Washington and Mark Wahlberg. Where's the money coming from now? Where do you go get money now? Different parts of the world, different it comes, it comes from all over. All over. Um, my next picture, I have some Saudi Arabian money and some Russian money. Is there more money available now than proportionally allowing for inflation, or less money? I'd say less money. Do me a favor, because I want to go. I want to go text. We have to. We have to let them know that we're running beyond. Bear with me. I'll be right. I, I would like. I would like to. I would like to ask you, I have Alec for this next film. It's, it's a political romantic adventure. We're going to be shooting in the Middle East. Would you be interested in getting involved, financing a movie with Alec, with Nev Campbell, with four, three or four other names, political romantic adventure at 15 to 20 million? Nev Campbell is wonderful, but doesn't have <laughs> marquee value today. Alec Baldwin is sensational, right. but can't, does, does not denote a theatrical movie. Just for argument's sake, the kind of movie we're thinking of couldn't go much lower than that, but what would be the number that that cast would be a feasible bet? Four to five million. I'm too old for that, you know. It's like, okay. yeah, I, 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 I don't have that. It, you know, it's, it's horrendous. It is horrendous. It's, it's either very, very big or yeah. very, very yeah. small. There's nothing in between. So right from the horse's mouth. Um, and actually, so that was from a few years ago. Uh, I think they shot this in 2012. So I think the 2 to 10 dead zone was in the 5 to 10 at that point. It actually was, and now it's gone even. For, as ac What happens is every year is the acquisition prices go down and down and down. Um, the dead zone just gets wider. And the reason why the acquisitions prices are going down, by the way, um, is driven by the fact that uh, with, you know, I talked about there's a lot more distribution opportunities in digital right now, but the problem is um, the revenue hasn't reached the levels of where home entertainment was. Um, and so distributors just physically can't pay as much as they used to because they can't make that as much in the market yet. Uh, because the penetration of, of digital isn't where home entertainment was at its heyday.